we've been talking a lot today about community and a community advancement and using, leveraging community to advance your careers, um, advance ideas. But I'm going to take a different approach and talk about this from a different perspective, which is organizational advancement and something that is really powerful as a competitive, sustainable advantage. Now, the world is full of innovations and ideas and patents, and fits and starts of great ideas can happen anywhere and at any time. But the key to organizational advancement is unblocking your ability to innovate, perform, and achieve top-notch performance over the long term. This idea of group innovation that drives performance. And the key is culture. There was an article in Forbes magazine in February. The author said, given enough time and money, your competitors can match really anything you do. They can steal your best people or your best ideas. They can reverse engineer your processes. The one thing that they cannot do, which is unique to you or your organization, is duplicate your culture. And we talk a lot about culture, and it says we use in business the importance of strong culture. Um, but it has to not only be understood, but purposefully and continuously nurtured. And we have to fiercely protect our culture. Culture is defined in the dictionary by shared beliefs and values of a people, an organization, a business. And clearly you can see the advantages when employees come together and share the same ideas and values. It makes our job as leaders a lot more difficult when everybody is on the same page. But taking it a step further, you cannot rely solely on corporate culture to advance your business. You need obviously to have a great business strategy and a great leadership team. The alignment, though, however, of these three things, the alignment of your corporate culture with your business strategy and a leadership team that understands and supports that connection can drive breakthrough performance and a sustainable competitive advantage. And I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about my company and my business and why I feel so passionately about this, because this here is the secret sauce um, for an industry that I worked in for 34 years that has been plagued by deteriorating customer service, been plagued by bankruptcies and, in, and financial instability. I work in the airline industry, and I have for 34 years. And collectively, as an industry, we have not made any money since Orville Wright. <laughs> that is, all of the losses of every airline in the U.S., minus all the profits, we are in the negative. So to me, after 34 years in the business, I'm exhausted. I'm really kind of tired of going to cocktail parties and when I, people ask me what I do, and they said, oh, well, let me tell you about my lost luggage. So I want, we want to have great customer service and, great, and, and a profitability that can sustain us. But I'm excited. For the last 10 years, I work for a company that has actually figured this out in order to achieve real turnaround performance. The airline I work for is the number two largest airline in the world. And you know, month after month for the last five years, we've seen improving customer satisfaction ratings and are now the most profitable airline in the U.S. So I work for Delta, and I would like just to humble, you know, just patience with me for about 60 seconds because I want to talk about culture and um, who best to talk about our culture than the employees. I think for Delta, besides believing in the product of number one, safe air travel, but the customer service is just as important. For being such a global company, we have these strong hometown values that I really, really respect. We work for a company that values not only its people, but the communities in which we serve. The airline is a team, and in a way, we have to be close as a family. In-flight service, a couple years ago for a leadership meeting, 
They have flight attendants volunteer their time um, to learn dance steps to do a flash mob. There's something to be said about employees who say, I want to do it, I want to do it, I volunteer to be part of something great. Employees and people are always going to be the difference between one business and another. So thank you for that. I, you know, Jeannie um, Mitchell was a flight attendant in that with 20 years of experience. We are a you know, very senior airline workforce. Our average, I, I supervise a group of flight attendants, 20,000, and our average seniority is 21 years. It's average. I gave away um, two weeks ago in the space of a week, I gave three 50-year pins to employees that have been there. And so I think the reason I say that is because, you know, you can have iconic leaders, and Stephen Jobs, of course, has understood the link between culture and business strategy and leadership. Um, the founder of Delta 81 years ago was a guy by the name of C.E. Woolman, and he got it too. He understood the link between the two 81, 82 years ago. Um, he produced a book called The Rules of the Road for every employee that started um, with Delta, and these were the constitutional principles of how we were going to treat each other. And the fundamental um, was treat each other with dignity and respect, treat each other as you would want to be treated, um, be honest and open in our communications, and use good judgment. You know, we really relied on employees for a long time to use good judgment, and even long after a CE woman retired and we no longer gave out this rules of the road, you could really feel the culture of Delta. But in the 1990s, faced with rapid expansion of low-cost carriers, Delta, like most legacy carriers in the U.S., was in financial distress. And during this very, very difficult period of time when our existence depended on lowering our cost, we made a mistake of sacrificing our culture in order to reduce cost. So that notion of judgment, you know, and doing the right thing, we kind of put processes and policies in place that disallowed us from doing the right thing and using good, good judgment. We needed to lower our costs desperately. And while that still was a very um, critical need um, and for the good of the organization in the long term, um, the, it's the manner in which you do it and, and the respect for culture and how you make changes to your processes and businesses when you need to. You know, and we paid the ultimate price. So we lost kind of the, the, the leaders were frustrated, the frontline employees were frustrated, our customers were frustrated, and led us into bankruptcy in 2005. But the great story, the turnaround story, that in bankruptcy, we really began to refocus on culture, on corporate culture, um, what, was, what were the values of our employees, the shared values and beliefs, um, we started with bringing in 45,000 employees face-to-face. -face. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about online communities and the value of social media. See, I think it was MySpace, actually, that was the, the uh, social media of the time um, when we did this. Um, but we, there's nothing more valuable in times of crisis than face-to-face -face communication. And so we did this over a six-month period with the senior most leaders at, at Delta and talked and apologized. I think that's something in business that when we make mistakes or we kind of lose our way, it's important to admit to those and apologize. The other thing that companies need to do is listen, obviously. Listen is important, and you need that two-way dialogue to do that. But we listened to our employees, and we really um, understood as we were formulating, and we had a business strategy, of course, to present to these employees, but it helped us, that listening helped us to make some adjustments to the strategy. For, for example, our customer, I mean, our employees truly deeply cared about each other. They still did. It was at the heart and the core of the brand. Um, and they cared about our communities. So what we did is relaunched um, a number of affinity employee networks. So the women's employee network, the gay and lesbian employee network, the Latino employee network, and a host of others. We went deeper into the causes that our employees wanted to support. So we painted an airplane for Habitat for Humanity in our first Johannesburg flight. We flew that with employees to go build homes in uh, Africa. We uh, rallied a, a bunch of our flight attendants, for example, were really passionate about breast cancer. 
And one flight attendant came up with the idea to sell um, a pink martini on the airplane, and we raised $17,000 that year. Five years later, we gave a check to BCRF for $1.25 million. Same. So the power, and what, while we hadn't gotten all the things corrected that we needed to um, as a business, what this did is this engagement with employees and, and uh, doing things that they were passionate about created a pride again, and how important that pride is in your company. Um, something very remarkable happened during this period at a time, too, and when we were, it was, this is the kind of aha moment, I think, for the leadership team, was we were faced with a hostile takeover bid. And so there was a grassroots re uh, effort of employees um, that teamed up together. They put buttons and wore them on their uniforms, which they weren't supposed to do. But we wore them on the uniforms that said, keep Delta, my Delta, and put up banners in airports and really changed the, what could have been a very dif uh, different outcome. So what I'm trying to get across is that strong culture drives business success, that it, it's not cost-cutting that's good for the bottom line. It is this notion of strong culture that drives business success. Short, in the last few years, we started um, doing a lot of surveys in a big way, 8 million surveys to customers every year, um, tens of thousands of employee surveys. And uh, kind of a not surprising thing that we found is the linkage between happy employees and happy customers. There is absolutely a correlation between the two, which shouldn't be a surprise, but it's pretty evident when you see this number of surveys. And then when you have happy customers, you have happy shareholders. So this virtuous circle of happy employees make happy customers, make happy shareholders is something that's very basic, um, but I think it's kind of a good reminder for all of us. Um, this summer, Harvard Business Review had an article also about culture, and in it, it uh, said that leaders need to take more time to honor their culture and identify the strengths of those, of that culture. And it said, you know, we're all faced with business challenges and highs and lows, and, and it's a very turbulent business environment we live in. Um, but too often times, we take kind of a business crisis and try to transform ourselves. Um, we tried to transform our culture. An example um, used was, you know, a company that is very deep into customer service may find it cannot afford the level of customer service they provide. But instead of trying to wipe that out and transform that, we should focus on critical shifts in behavior and really focus on the informal and formal networks that advance our culture. So it's not just about the, the structure we put in place, but those kind of employee networks and, and the informal networks that we can use to advance our culture. You know, um, culture should never impede um, change. Culture should enable change when a business needs to change. And as we did, and we've seen um, our company suffer when we lost sight of culture, and we've seen it thrive as we've regained in that reawakening of, of the Delta culture. Um, there's a couple of, there's four things, four principles here that um, I think are very important for any business. First is to build a culture around your employees. Employees should be at the center. They're, they're, they are your most valuable asset. The second is to build a strategy then that aligns with that culture. Find out what your employees are passionate about and work that into processes and procedures and into your, into your goals and objectives. This third one I think is just so critical. Look for people who fit your culture. How often do we in our businesses when we're looking for to hire somebody or even as we're looking for a new career ourselves and how often do we say where does my experience fit um, in that business? How can I best uh, put my resume together to fit the, what they're looking for? Or as a hiring manager, you know, what's your experience and, and to fit the need I have? And then we, then we, of course, we say, and, you know, will this person be the right fit for the organization? I think we flip-flop that. I think the first thing we need to do is to look for people to work for or to employ that share the values and beliefs of the organization and of our culture. And not only for that in when you're starting out a job, 
but as we advance leaders, is leaderships that, that fit the values and beliefs of the organization. And then finally, um, ask employees if culture is being supported on a routine basis. You know, I think it's very important, and I know there's, we can't always get face-to-face, -face, thank goodness for the online communities, but um, doing a survey, at least annually, and asking how the culture is supported and what can we do differently and, and kind of pulse that uh, and give yourself a, a baseline every year that you can improve upon and, and build an action plan to address problem areas critical. You know, in the end, um, my last um, point is, you know, there are, any product or any service can be matched. Um, your culture cannot. We live in very turbulent times. Social media is changing the way we do our business. Technology is changing our business. Culture does not need to be turbulent. Culture is the most enduring part of business, at least for businesses that want to endure. Thanks very much.